Father, we come this morning and we expect, we're anxiously uh, expecting that you will speak to us. And I pray you would, Father, as we look into your word, that the truth of that would become real and apparent to us. And Father, we would see your greatness and your goodness. It would become a reality in our lives today. And Father, that it would become action in our lives as well. So bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be in Matthew 24, starting at verse 36, where it says this, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angel of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming, coming in an hour when you do not expect. So Jesus was responding to the question of the disciples, when is the end going to come? And what's the sign that you're coming back? And Jesus, in this chapter, Matthew 24, gives broad strokes of what we should look for. And I read something this week that I thought was so brilliant, but so simple and so obvious. And somebody was saying, if we want to know the clues to Jesus' second coming, his return, we have to look at his first coming. The first time Jesus came, Christmas, which we're going to celebrate soon, the signs of His coming. If you look in the Old Testament, there was clues that He was coming. But nobody put those clues together and said, hey, He's coming at this day and this time. Right? The clues were there, and He did come, but it wasn't so crystal clear that everybody knew. And so God's giving us broad strokes. He's giving us generalities of what to look for. Just as it was when he came the first time, that's the way it is the second time he's coming. There are only broad strokes. Now this is one of only two mentions in the Bible that talks about this idea of believers being caught up. And notice it says, on the day of the Lord, meaning the day that Jesus returns, that will happen. That there are, there's going to be two people together. One will be caught up. That's what rapture means. It means to be caught up. And one will be left. Now, interestingly, this theologian I was reading this week says the common thinking in our thinking today is that we will be caught up and there will be a seven-year period and then Jesus will come back. That's the common thing. If we read the scripture the way it was written, Jesus said, on the day of the Lord, two people were together and one brought up. There's no indication of a seven-year gap at all that I can see. It's not there. And um, this theologian was saying actually that it's not the Christians who will be caught up. It's the Christians that will remain. And the non-Christians that get caught up. Because Jesus is coming to redeem the world. He's going to redeem it. He's going to remake it. He's going to put it back the way it was. And that's where we'll be. We're part of that redeemed world. So I just offer that as food for God. So how? How do we prepare for this day of the Lord coming? Let me ask you this. Have you ever under-prepared for anything? Under-prepared. You thought you were ready, but then you found out that you weren't. So back in 1988, I was a single young man, uh, and I worked in a comic store. And the objective of most comic fans is to go to the San Diego Comic Convention. And that's what I did in 1980. I saved up my money. And you don't make a lot working in a comic store. Um, I didn't have a girlfriend, right? So I could, I could go, and that's what I did. I saved up my money. 1988, I went to the San Diego Comic Convention. Um, it's, I don't know if you're familiar with it, now it's actually the news. It's become this huge um, cultural event. But back then, it was pretty much only nerdy comic guys. 
you know. Um, and so I, I saved up my money, I went, it was four days long, and I only had so much money. Well, by the second day, I had spent a good chunk of that money. I wasn't going to make it to the fourth day. I, had, I overspent. There's so much stuff to buy that you want, right? And so I just, I didn't have much, enough money. So the third day, I decided I can't buy anything. I got to save what I have left for the last day, because the last day, the dealers don't want to bring stuff back to them. They'll offer deals and stuff. So that third day, I, I didn't buy anything. There's other stuff to do, and I just enjoyed the convention without spending money. And I want to show you, um, I guess you're familiar with the, the illustrator, uh, J.C. Leyendecker. Sure. Well, I, I'm going to show you some of his work. He was a, a cover artist for the Saturday Evening Post. Saturday Evening Post was the biggest magazine in America for many, many, many years. And so he always did special <coughs> things, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. And one of the things I got, I got the actual covers, not the actual artwork, but the covers, old covers of Saturday Evening Post that he painted. And these are the two that I got. And really, that has nothing to do with the message, but it's just a chance <laughs> for me to introduce you to J.C. Lyon. That guy was a, he was a genius. He was fantastic. Okay, so thinking of that idea, being underprepared, Jesus talks about his return. And after that, in the chapter right after that, he tells stories to help make clear his point, what he wants us to know. He tells a story of there's going to be a wedding. And he says there are ten virgins. And in a Jewish wedding back in that day, what would happen is the groom and his family and friends would go from his house in a procession to the bride's house. And they would get the bride and make a big deal. And they would um, go together back to his house. And that's where the party would begin. And friends and acquaintances, if it was at night, they would light lamps and they would accompany them to light the way because they don't have street lamps in uh, ancient Israel, right? So he tells the story of these ten virgins who are waiting for the groom and they've got their lamps. And five are wise, he said. They got extra oil for their lamps. And five are foolish. They don't have extra. So if the groom came when they expected, all of them would be okay. But if he delays, if he comes at a time they don't expect, the foolish ones are going to be in trouble, but the wise ones are going to be okay. And that's exactly what happens in the story. The groom is late. They've fallen asleep waiting for him. And uh, now the wise ones have enough oil. They can light their lamps. They can go into the groom. The foolish ones don't have enough oil. They've got to go buy it because they don't have enough. By the time they get back, the groom and the wedding party is already brought in the house and they say, you're too late. You can't come in. Now there's lots of theological thinking on what this story means, but it means one thing for sure, that all ten of them were looking forward to the same thing. And all ten of them did not expect he would come at the time he came, but ten prepared for that eventuality, and five did it. The five that were prepared, they got what they were after. The five that didn't missed out because they ran out of fuel. They were short on gas. Right? So Jesus is trying to tell us we need to think about this. So how do we apply this now today? And I think that this predominant thinking of this secret rapture is a way of running short of fuel. Because think of it this way. Many people are counting on that idea that, hey, before this terrible trouble comes upon them, God will take us away. And that's what they're counting on. But what if he doesn't? What if they're wrong? Because remember, all ten expected the groom at a certain time, and he didn't come. So what if those ones that expected to, to take them away before are wrong? I think they're going to be short on fuel if he's delayed. They're not going to be prepared for what's coming. They need to be ready for that. But what if you were saying, well, I have a groom. That might happen, but I think it might not. I think it might come at the end. I think he's going to take us when he comes back, and we're going to have to endure this time of trouble. Wouldn't you be prepared? Wouldn't you have extra fuel to endure that time, to see you through to the end? And I don't think this is specifically what Jesus was talking about, but I think it applies to what he meant. And he's saying, we have to be prepared. And if we're not, we're going to suffer loss, just like those foolish virgins who are waiting. Now, uh, 
part of the problem with this whole thinking. I want that to be true. I want that pre-tribulation rapture, they call it, to be true. I want it to be true. Now that doesn't mean it isn't true. But I have to be careful that that desire to avoid this isn't clouding my thinking. Right? I've got to read what does the word say. I can't turn it into something I want it to say. I have to read what it does say. And my desire to want to avoid that, I have to be aware of that. So I don't allow it to cloud my thinking. Amen? Amen. Now, if we want to properly prepare, I think the key in what Jesus talked about today is he said, in the days of Noah. And isn't it interesting that it's, Jesus talks about such ordinary behavior. He says, in the days of Noah, God's about to wipe out all the people on earth. And he says, Jesus says, well, they were married, they were given in marriage, they were eating and drinking. In some sense, ordinary life will be going on. But the Bible tells us that when God looked at the earth in those days, He saw evil continually. He said violence was everywhere. And when He looked into people's hearts, all He saw was evil intentions in their hearts. And that's that. And once it's in the heart, it's gone. And that's all He saw. And that's why He thought He had to judge the earth. And so Jesus says the same thing. That that's what it will be like when He comes back. And so Noah built an ark. But you could say that God provided that ark. After all, it was God's idea. God told him to do it. God gave him the specifics on how to make it. Right? Noah did not come up with this himself. God didn't say, Noah, flood's coming. You better get ready. He said, Noah, this is what I want you to do. I want you to build an ark. And I want you to build it like this, this, and this. So even though Noah did the work, you could say God provided that for Noah. And then the last direction God gave them about that ark was to build a door in the side of it. And he said, once you get all the animals, once you go in, when he told them to go in, he said that God himself shut that door. In other words, God sealed Noah in that ark of safety. God was the one that sealed him in there. It says that Noah acted in faith in response to God. Hebrews 11, 7. It says, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, isn't this similar to what Jesus is talking about in this chapter? He's warning us about stuff that hasn't happened yet. He was telling Noah, a flood's going to come on earth. It had never rained before. I want you to build a boat. What's a boat? What's an ark? Noah didn't know. But he obeyed God in faith. And God is telling us about things that haven't happened yet. And we're either going to respond in the right way, or we're not going to. We need to decide what we're going to do. Now, um, Noah was surely ridiculed for what he was doing. What are you doing, Noah? What do you think you're doing? Come on, party with us. Why are you doing that stupid whatever it is? You're crazy. God's not going to come. It says he was ridiculed. It doesn't say that, but we know that was probably the case. But he acted in reverent fear. In other words, everything around him was anti-God. They were disobeying God. And yet, out of fear of God, he obeyed God. And he probably was ridiculed and harassed for that. And what happened when Noah did that? When he did that, it became a testimony to the people around him of the righteousness of God. See, when, when good people suffer for doing good, it's a testimony to the reality of God, God's goodness and God's judgment. Why else would they do it? If they didn't believe in a righteous God that will make things right, why would you go against the tide? Why would you fight it? Unless you believe there is right and wrong. Unless you believe God will justify you someday. It becomes a testimony. Now, God's judgment will fall at the end, too. That's what the book of Revelation is about. It details God's judgment coming on the earth. And let me just say that because of a lot of anxiety, it's a good thing. It has to happen. The world cannot hold together unless God is a just God. And this judgment is good. Even if we were to experience that judgment, if we were separate from God, that judgment would be a good thing. All God does is good. Amen? And we and our families will be protected 
from that judgment. Did you know that you and I are sealed? You know how it says God closed the door and sealed them in the ark? You and I are sealed too. Did you know the Bible says that? More than once. Ephesians uh, 4.20 says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Until the day of redemption, God has sealed us with the Holy That's His assurance that the Holy Spirit is in us, that God will see us through to the end. We will make it through to the end. That's God's assurance. That's His promise to us that you and I are sealed. We are protected. We can talk all about that. There's so much in the Bible that, that tells us that, that, that we are sealed and protected. Now, Noah's Ark was provided by God. God provided <coughs> And it protected Noah and his family. And God's judgment fell on that ark. Right? The rain was God's judgment. He wiped their all life on earth. The ark experienced that judgment. It experienced the rain. But Noah and his family were safe inside. And God has provided us and our too for our day of judgment. And our, our ark is Jesus. Right? Jesus experienced God's judgment on the cross. He took it so that we don't have to. We are protected by Him. Someday you and I will stand before God by ourselves and we'll have to give an account of, of our lives. And you and I could not stand before a holy God. We could not. Except for when God looks at us, He's going to see Jesus. He's going to see the blood of Jesus that took the penalty for us. He's going to say, okay, I, I see Jesus' blood. You get to go. You're okay. Jesus took the penalty for you, and I see you through that blood. That blood sealed us. It protects us. It's an ark. Jesus was our ark because he took the judgment that you and I were supposed to get. And so we're protected. We're set free. Jesus is our ark. Now our fuel in getting through this time is our faith in God. That's our fuel. Our faith in God. So that's... Our part is the fuel. God provides the protection. God provides the salvation. Our fuel is just to trust in that, to put our trust in that. Now, maybe your faith is small. Maybe it's uncertain. Maybe your faith is shaky. But you know what? Even that faith that we have, even that God provides, if you and I have any measure of faith, any trust in God at all, God gave that to us too. God's going to see us through to the end. And God says, faith the size of a mustard seed. Would you? And I don't actually know how big a mustard seed is. But clearly by the story, it's a small seed, right? That's the whole point. It's a small seed. So if you have faith the size of a small seed, would you say your faith is at least that big? Would you say it's at least as big as a seed? Then God says, you can move mountains. That's all it takes. It's not the strength of our faith. It's what the faith is in. We believe in a great God, a loving God, and a little faith in a great God goes a long way. It's enough to see us through to the end. It's enough. And God even gave us that. Now, if we suffer, if we should, and the Bible says that some are appointed, some are appoint, uh, appointed to martyrdom at the end. And some, in all likelihood, some of us here, if, if the end comes in our lifetime, and that's no certainty, then some of us here may be appointed, likely appointed to martyrdom. If that happens, God will surely provide the faith we need to see that through. But it's not meaningless suffering. Remember we talked about that. Um, when a righteous person suffers for their faith, it's a testimony. And in a dark world, in a world lost, don't you think God wants to be? God's judgment is not the end. God's judgment is to turn them around, is to get them to repent and come to Him. The, the end comes when Jesus returns. That's when it's over. There's no opportunity after that. But the judgment that comes before that is meant to turn people to God. Now, don't you think that a light shines brightest in the darkness, and, and we are God's light in this world? And so we may, some of us, be asked to suffer. But maybe that's something worth being thankful for. Remember the story in the beginning of Acts. Um, Peter and John, they go to the temple. That's their habit. They go to the temple. 
And they begin to talk about Jesus. They, they heal a guy who is lame, and they say, hey, Jesus did this. The people get all excited. They're talking about Jesus. Well, the religious leaders don't like that. And so they take them, and they want to arrest them, and say, don't do that anymore. And they say, well, we can't help it. We've got to do it. And we're going to do it. And they decide to let them go. But first, they beat them. Say, okay, you can go. But they beat them to punish them. And what do Peter and John do? They're skipping and laughing and jumping out of that place because they felt so privileged to suffer for their faith that they were counted worthy to suffer for their faith. And God may count us worthy to suffer for our faith. That's, that's what he's may call us to do. And it helps clarify why we're here. See, God didn't save us to provide us a life of comfort. Now, I do believe that God wants to provide us that. Jesus said, I came that you would have peace and comfort. My, my yoke is easy and my burden is like he said that. But that's not the end. See, God still has work to do. And a baby, you don't expect much from a baby. You expect them to eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom. Don't you? You don't expect any more. Um, and of course, they give us lots of pleasure, right? Because they're so dang cute. No pressure on my um, daughter and future son-in-law who have grandchildren. I know it's coming, but I can wait. But you don't expect anything from a baby. But wouldn't it be sad if you saw an adult in diapers being wheeled around by their mom in a, a stroller, being treated like a baby when they were adult and capable of more? Well, spiritually, God wants us to grow up. He wants us to be mature. And part of that is to join in the work that He's doing. I have something for you to do. Is to reach out to these people. These people are lost. You and I, we're set. We're good to go. Our futures are sure. But there's a lot of lost people out there. And we're trying to reach them. God is. And He wants to use us to do that. And so he wants us to join him in his work. And that means serving. It absolutely means serving. It means to take the role of a servant. And you may not get thanked. You may not get acknowledged. But we're not doing it for that reason. And everybody likes to be thanked. And likes to be acknowledged. I certainly do. But our motivation is to do it for God. To do it for him. Because of all that he's done for us. That's why we're here. We're really here, I see, for two purposes. The main purpose is to give God the glory and obey His will. But we are meant to love each other and meet each other's needs, to be a real, genuine community. And we are meant to reach out to the people who don't know God, to show them what they're missing out on. Do we have something real or don't we? And if we do, then we've got to let them know. Right? We've got to let them know. And Aikahi has a, an event coming up on the 11th, I think. They have, they have this fundraiser, and our opportunity is, you see, if we create how we're gonna, if we say, this is how we're gonna help you, that, that's okay, that's not gonna say that. But if they have a need, and we match our giving to their need, is that much more meaningful? And they need help, they ask for help. And so we're gonna, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna rent the booth, and we're gonna provide free gift wrapping. And it's from 3 to 8. And we've done it before, and Kenneth is in charge, and no act. <laughs> He's acting all surprised. <laughs> Just so you know, he loves to wrap stuff. <laughs> People are into different things. Ken is into wrapping presents. Okay? And so if you can sign up, this is we want to give. We just want to give. There's no charge. We're just giving this um, to you. But Maybe there's too many of us. Maybe more, hopefully, of us want to help than can be at the booth. Well, there's other areas to help. There's a, a sign-up sheet on the table. This is our way. You know, if we just take an hour, that's all it is, an hour out of our time, to give to this world. Why? To show them that God loves them. That's the whole intent of it, is to show that God loves them. How? By giving. By giving with no expectation. Nothing. We sit through on you. Doesn't would that somewhat blow your mind? I mean, I'm sure there's many good people that will be helping. But if somebody gives something, expecting nothing in return, and there's they give nothing to us in a sense, right? We get nothing from them. 
uh, usually every every giving, any ex every interchange of giving, there's something in return. It's even true with my wife. If I'm nice to her, I love her. If I'm nice to her, I do get a benefit. She'll naturally respond positively to me. I mean, there's a selfish moment. There is an element of selfishness in that. It's not wrong. I mean, it's I should treat her well, regardless of how she treats me. I should. <laughs> but still, there's that element of selfishness. But this is giving our joy. What we want to get back is that they would connect with God. If we got that, if they would just open their heart and their mind to God, we would get what we're after. That's what we want in response. Amen? Let's try it one more time. Is that, can you give me an amen? For that? Amen. Now, one more thing. Avery, can I ask you, do you mind standing up, please? I'm not going to see that shirt. He's a wonderful model. His name can you do the tour all for us. <laughs> Thank you, Avery. I appreciate that. So, we have these shirts. And if you don't have one, we want to give you one. We want to give you one because we're going to wear those shirts when we go to Aikahi or uh, in December, we're going to go back out and we're going to give to the folks at the park. And we did that last week, and, and people wore the shirts, and um, her uncle, my wife, the kind of said it was better. People responded a little better, because we didn't look like a bunch of, who are these people? There was kind of some, it looked like we were legitimate, you know what I mean? So we want you to have a shirt. Please take a shirt. In fact, her was back there setting things up for that. Amen? So I, I hope, uh, we're talking about the end of the world, which is not the happiest subject to talk about. But I, I think we have reason for hope that it's a, it is ultimately a good thing. And God will protect us. That's why Jesus could say, you know what? Some of you, they're going to murder. Some of you, they are going to kill. But not a hair of your head will be harmed. Jesus is saying, look, in the end, you're going to be perfectly fine. In the end, there's going to be nothing wrong with you. You may suffer before that, but it's for a good purpose, and I'm going to set it right. So, um, hopefully we begin to see this vision of what God is calling us to, to, to be filled with Him and, and spread that to the people around us. Amen? Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for your word, which is trying to assure us, uh, as we follow you like Noah, in reverent fear and obedience in faith, you will protect us. You will provide for us. Jesus, you are our ark. That you took the, the punishment for us. And we are safe in you. And Father, I pray that each one of us would find not fear from this idea, but rather encouragement and boldness. That we are here for a purpose, Father. That we are here according to your will to bring the light to this dark world. To minister Father, that we have the privilege of joining you in your work of, of salvation, of bringing the gospel to the whole world. And Father, may we as a church, may we love and bless one another. May we tolerate our shortcomings, and uh, but find reason to, to see the good in each one of us, Father, to see what you see in each of us. You love us and you see something worth loving in each one of us. Show us that in each other. But Father, also help us to love our community, whom we don't know, uh, but to be a part of it, to serve them, Father, because it'll give you glory, it'll please you, and hopefully it'll connect them to you. Uh, and Father, we just, uh, I pray a blessing on these people. I thank you for your faithfulness and love. May we be just as faithful and loving to you as you are to us. All this follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.